Uh, good evening. I'm Dave Stewart, um, Interim President of SAR. I want to welcome all of you, uh, guests, SAR members, board members, colleagues, and friends of John Kantner. <laughs> now let me introduce John. He's not only an esteemed colleague of mine, uh, but a great favorite among the folks at SAR and our community, sort of the SAR family. He's known for his hard work, his high level of scholarship, and his dedication to SAR. John earned his PhD from UCAL Santa Barbara and joined the University of North Florida last August as Assistant Vice President for Research. He has recently added to his portfolio Dean of Graduate Studies, and I think that's a nice title to have. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to that, he was Vice President for Academic and Institutional Advancement at SAR. And prior to his coming to SAR, he was an Associate Professor of Anthropology in the Department of Anthropology and Geography at Georgia State. Dr. Kantner is an anthropological archaeologist with a broad background in the social sciences. He studied archaeology, anthropology, geography, geochemistry, and evolutionary theory along the way. His research focuses on the archaeology of ancient societies with a particular interest in the processes by which complex social and political regional institutions emerged from communities of comparatively simple horticulturalists. Those of you who heard my earlier lectures in the fall on Chaco know that I take a slightly different approach, but it's the same theme. <laughs> we all take different approaches. <laughs> and his research is explicitly comparative, which makes it anthropological. In addition to his best known book, The Ancient Pueblo Southwest, John's research has appeared in very prestigious journals such as Human Nature, the Journal of Anthropological Archaeology, the Journal of Anthropological Research, Journal of Archaeological Research, Journal of Archaeological Science, and Historical Archaeology. In short, he represents the best of SAR. Please welcome John Kantner for tonight's lecture, A Tale of Two Pilgrimage Centers, Chaco and Nazca. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much. Uh, it sounds like the sound is on. Let me get this out of the way. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I, I can't tell you how special it is to be back at SAR. Uh, my wife and I are staying on campus. It feels like we've just been on a very long vacation in Jacksonville and now are back. And to be here giving a lecture to all my friends and colleagues and, and uh, admirers of SAR is truly wonderful. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is to dedicate this lecture to a friend and colleague who is no longer with us, and that is Dr. Linda Cordell, who passed away a year ago tomorrow, I think it was. The first time I gave a version of this lecture, which wasn't actually very good, it was too long and I had some trouble with it, uh, she was in the audience, and, uh, and those of you who know Linda know that she uh, was someone who dished out both compliments and constructive criticism um, equally. And, <laughs> I, could, I can still see her sitting there looking at me with a sort of somewhat quizzical look. And uh, I managed to get through the lecture, and she had some, some great positive comments to say about it. But we all miss Linda, um, and so I definitely want to dedicate this lecture to her. I have to say, when uh, I was coming over in the car and I uh, suggested that I would do this to my wife, um, that I would honor Linda tonight, uh, my wife said, well, would Linda like it? <laughs> Linda, I hope you like this lecture. <laughs> so what I want to do tonight is to uh, uh, talk about these two pilgrimage centers. And uh, as I often do, there'll be five different parts to the lecture. So the first part of this lecture is to uh, present some unresolved questions about pilgrimage more generally, about pilgrimage behavior and pilgrimage centers. Uh, 
Then I'll introduce Chaco Canyon and Nazca and give some basic information about them. I know many, many people here know Chaco and probably Nazca fairly well, but I want to at least put out my understanding of some of the basic information, obviously leading towards the third part, which is where I outline why we consider these to be pilgrimage destinations. There are some people who don't agree with this uh, interpretation, and some of them may even be in the audience here today, but uh, I'm going to present some ideas about why I think that these two locations were the destinations for ancient pilgrimage. The fourth section then will explore some similarities in when, where, and how these different centers emerged. And then finally at the end, I'll present a model that explains pilgrimage, or think it explains pilgrimage, at least for these two cases, and arguably maybe uh, applicable to other parts of the ancient world, and perhaps even tell us something about pilgrimage today. So pilgrimage, where, when, and why? There's a lot of unresolved questions about ancient pilgrimage. We know that probably it happened, it certainly happens today, but why does it appear where it does and when it does? If we take a look at the anthropological uh, history of scholarship on pilgrimage, uh, we can go back to, for example, the French sociologist Emile Durkheim, who in the early 20th century saw pilgrimage as a case of what he called collective effervescence. The collective effervescence created a sense of solidarity that functioned in his uh, theory as a social glue that bonded society together. Half a century later, Victor Turner, the famous anthropologist, looked at pilgrimage as a way to relieve social tension by allowing pilgrims to enter a liminal state, neither here nor there, betwixt and between, in which the, uh, the, the social tensions between class and so forth could be worked out and a quasi-egalitarian sense of what he called communitas could emerge. More recently, in the last uh, couple of decades, there's been the emergence of what are sometimes referred to as contestation models, which really are quite opposite to Victor Turner and Durkheim's viewpoints. In this idea, pilgrimage centers are really arenas of contestation. These are places where differences are actually actively displayed and contested in what the advocates of this particular uh, perspective refer to as the religious void that pilgrimage creates. So all these ideas are great, and they may, in fact, be correct uh, in various situations, but none of them really explain why pilgrimage emerges, where it does, how it emerges. It doesn't explain really more than just sort of a synchronic perspective on what any particular pilgrimage experience might be like at any particular moment in time. As, of course, an, an archaeologist, I'm really interested in looking at a diachronic explanation to try to explain, again, uh, uh, why and how they emerge in the places and the times that they do. So with that in mind, what, uh, what I like to do is, if I'm trying to answer a question like this, is to try to take a comparative approach. And I've worked on Chaco for, for quite a long time, and I have a colleague who I went to graduate school with at the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, Kevin Vaughn, who's at Purdue University, who's worked in Nazca for a long time. And we have often marveled about how similar the sequences are, even though they're quite separate in time and space. And so we started to explore how comparing the two of these might provide us with, with some insight into how and why pilgrimage uh, uh, emerges. So we'll look first at Chaco, again, providing some basic information about what Chaco is. Everybody knows where Chaco Canyon is located, northwestern New Mexico. Uh, what is now northwestern New Mexico in a relatively arid environment. It's important to note, of course, that Chaco Canyon is more than just the monuments that you see in the park today, uh, but there was a much larger area shown here in gray where there is varying intensities of influence um, um, from the canyon itself. Here is an aerial view of the canyon uh, with a little bit of snow there. And uh, you can see it's not a very particularly deep canyon. Anybody who's been there knows that. Uh, it does have water, which is more or less permanent throughout the year, depending upon the overall climatic situation. And because of this, we have great preservation. And in the Southwest, we have something that archaeologists around the world envy, and that is tree ring dating, which allows us to reconstruct a pretty accurate chronology of what happens in Chaco Canyon. In the midst of farming villages that existed in the canyon in the ninth century, around the mid-800s or so emerges a new kind of architectural form that is, of course, most iconically represented by Pueblo Benito. 
This new architectural form is quite different from the normal uh, residences that people lived in. And this particular uh, reconstruction, which you're going to see here, shows you what this would have looked like. Great houses, as they're called, rise multiple stories. They have this massive core veneer masonry work. As you go into this large plaza, which is another characteristic of these great houses, you'll see in this cutaway that inside of these buildings are hidden away uh, these blocked-in kivas that you can see there. In front of the mass of these, this huge amount of masonry work, uh, of course, are the open plazas. And then also you'll see, emerging off there to the left, uh, great kivas, which are much larger versions of the ceremonial structures that you uh, find throughout the Puebloan uh, chronology. The important thing about these is, of course, there's a tremendous investment of labor into this. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later, but just wanted to point that out. Now, Chaco Canyon, although the earliest dates are for, for this phenomenon, the Great House phenomenon, are in the 800s or so, uh, it takes a couple centuries for the, what you see in Chaco Canyon today to fully develop. By 900, the beginning of the 10th century, as you can see here, there's three or four great houses in what we refer to as downtown Chaco. And they're built in, some, you can see they're most equally spaced, and they're built, as I mentioned before, in these villages that predate their emergence. In the next 200 years, through fits and starts, there's the development of much more of this kind of great house architecture, such that by 1100, uh, you'll see an immense number of these buildings and, and a huge amount of investment of labor in this downtown Chaco area, especially in the uh, vicinity of Pueblo Benito. Now, of course, Chaco Canyon is more than just the great house complexes. There also are the great kivas, such as this one, which is isolated and located across the canyon from uh, Pueblo Benito proper. Uh, these massive great kivas like Casa Rinconada um, are very carefully designed, carefully oriented to the cardinal directions. You can see here as you fly into the hill on which uh, Casa Rinconada sits uh, that in the uh, reconstruction, the alignment to the cardinal directions is so perfect that you can actually sightline equinox events through the windows of the antechamber of the Casa Rinconada. And of course, many people know about some of the other uh, astronomical observation points within this particular building. But the most famous, of course, of these astro uh, excuse me, uh, uh, astronomical observatories is Fajada Butte, where the famous sun dagger is located. Fajada Butte, which is off there on the horizon, if you're flying over it, uh, you'll notice, and you can sort of see it where the arrow is pointing, there are three vertical slabs. If we zoom into where those vertical slabs are located, uh, on the other side of those vertical slabs, uh, um, on the rock face, are carved two petroglyphs. And as the sun, during particular celestial events, passes through those stones, it forms daggers of light, which, depending upon the particular configuration of the daggers, are perfectly telling people viewing this when these uh, solar events are taking place. Here's an example of, uh, of how this is supposed to work. And there's even been some pretty interesting uh, work that suggested that some lunar events may also be recorded by this amazing feature found in Chaco Canyon. Finally, Chaco Canyon also has the famous road system that many people know about. Uh, articulating with the Great House complexes are a number of prehistoric roads, and you can sort of, sort of barely make it out here where the arrow is pointing. You can see a modern two-track, which is quite easy to see, but where the arrow is pointing is one of these ancient uh, uh, Chacoan roads, this one in particular being the South Road, which emanates out from near Pueblo Benito um, all the way south uh, across the San Juan Basin. Chaco, however, is much more than just what takes place in the canyon. About the same time that all this is developing within the canyon, villages all over the Pueblo and Southwest, all these farming villages, begin to construct their own replicas of the great house architecture, which, which is emerging within the canyon. Here are some 3D models which I built of um, some of these. Uh, and what you can notice right away is that the scale of these great houses is not nearly as impressive as what you see in the canyon, 
but they certainly are much more impressive than what people are living in in the villages in which these great houses emerge. Here's an aerial view of one of those haystack. You can see in the upper uh, third of the image there in the center is the remains of the haystack, the haystack great house. And you can just barely make out where uh, the plaza area is. You might even be able to see some of the kivas in this building. And you'll also notice where the arrows are pointing roadways. So not only are people outside of the canyon building great houses, but they're building many of the other features which are so iconic of, uh, of the canyon itself. And then finally, Chaco and pottery is quite distinctive as well. And wherever you see the impact of Chaco, you see this quite beautiful, um, abstracted, black on white pottery, which is characterized by this hatcher work, which some scholars think may represent stylized wings. So by the height of Chaco, which is in the very late 1000s, the Pueblo in Southwest is covered with Chacoan architecture, built within probably, I think, there are around 200 to 300 different villages that are engaging with Chaco by using this kind of pottery and by building architecture very much like the great houses. And they're even building their own roadways. So you can see emanating from Chaco the North Road and the South Road, but all these other places are also building their own roadways. So how about Nazca? Well, Nazca, and I should say a full disclaimer that I'm not an expert at Nazca. I have been there, but I'm trying to channel my colleague, Kevin Vaughn, on this. Uh, Nazca, uh, which is located on the south coast of Peru, is, uh, is famously located at the very northern tip of the Atacama Desert, one of the driest deserts in the world, in a place that's called the Sechura Desert. Nazca is, is uh, in a very dry, inhospitable environment. But it's important to note that although the, the desert itself is quite dry, there are rivers that run through it. These rivers actually are descending out of the Andes. Most of the water that the Andes captures, of course, runs to the east into the Amazon and its tributaries. But there is some water that runs down the west side. And it's interesting because as often as not, when this water hits the desert floor on the coast here, this coastal desert, it will go underneath the desert floor only to reemerge at various points later um, in, the, in the pathway of the river. Now, the aridity here is quite impressive, but we don't have, and we have great preservation, as you'll see in a moment, um, but the one thing we don't have for Nazca is great chronological control because there is no equivalent of tree ring dating. Within this coastal desert, around 100 BC, emerges a monumental center which is today known as Kawachi. So thinking of Chaco in the Chaco world, think of Kawachi and the Nazca world as being the equivalent here. This is an aerial view of uh, Kawachi. You can see the edge of the uh, river valley for the Nazca River on the upper uh, edge of the photo there. And what you're seeing are the excavations and the reconstructions of the Kawachi's monuments. It's interesting to note that this is a place where that water does emerge out of the desert floor in the Nazca Riverbed. The Kawachi Mounds, there's uh, dozens of these adobe buildings that are constructed here. What you're seeing is not the original um, architecture, but has been reconstructed, because uh, otherwise the adobe architecture isn't that impressive to see. So there's been quite a bit of reconstruction, which has been somewhat controversial as to its accuracy, but it certainly gives you some sense about the scale. Uh, there were dozens of these buildings that were constructed. And there's over 40 mounds that are arrayed around these buildings that are probably used as platform mounds for various ceremonies to take place. Of course, when people think about Nazca, mostly what they think about are the famous Nazca lines or the geoglyphs, represented here by this, this particular one, uh, the, the monkey figure, the monkey geoglyph. But the, the truth of the matter is that there are thousands of geoglyphs and the vast majority of them, the highest percentage of them, are actually straight lines and not these kinds of zoomorphs or other kinds of figurative geoglyphs. So here, if anybody's flown over, uh, over the Nazca Plain here, you've certainly seen these geoglyphs before. Uh, this gives you some sense about the numbers of them. They're just everywhere. Uh, they crisscross one another. Uh, there's been estimated to be um, thousands of them that cover thousands of kilometers if you were to measure their length. There's the monkey. You'll see um, some other ones that emerge, the, the uh, hummingbird. Uh, the heron was shown earlier. This is the tarantula. One thing which, of course, is interesting is that none of these animals actually really live here. They mostly live either in the Amazon, uh, 
or they represent uh, animals that live in the ocean, like the killer whale. Now, Nazca, just like Chaco, is more than just the center itself, more than just the center of Kawachi and the Nazca lines that surround it. There's actually quite a bit of evidence that by the height of, of Kawachi in the mid 400s, uh, there are hundreds of villages in the larger area that were in various ways demonstrating the influence of the center at Kawachi. And the most clear evidence of this is the famous Nazca pottery. The very fanciful polychromatic pottery that's produced in, during this time period is, is quite amazing. These pieces are amazing to behold, pretty easy to identify archaeologically, fortunately, when you find a piece like this. Uh, and I'll show you a couple more images later, but wherever you find this, this is considered to be uh, symbolic of a distant village's connection with the center at Kawachi. So what is the evidence then for pilgrimage. So we have these big centers, and that's one thing, but how do we know that actually people are going on pilgrimage there? Because that means something quite specific. I'm going to cover in this third section of the lecture four sources of information which we think probably uh, give you a good idea that Chaco and Nazca were the destinations of pilgrims. And the first of these is a term which is actually used in reference to Nazca, but could also be used in reference to Chaco, and this is the sheer intensity of ceremonial activity that is evidenced at these centers certainly suggests that it's meant to be spectacle for people to behold. And that suggests that people are coming there specifically to participate in these rituals. I already mentioned the large plaza areas and the platform mounds that make up the bulk of the architectural work at uh, Kawachi itself. And certainly, if you look at the spaces that comprise buildings like Pueblo Benito in Chaco Canyon, you'll see many scales of ritual activity from these platform mounds located in front of the building proper on, upon which perhaps ceremonies would, would take place that could be viewed by people, many people outside of the building. But there's also, of course, the large plazas themselves in which ritual activities probably took place. Moving to a somewhat more exclusionary space, you have the great kivas that may have accommodated 100 people or so that were observing ritual events. And then, perhaps most hidden and secretive of all, would have been the blocked-in kivas that, during the time this building was occupied, would not have been necessarily visible or even known to people viewing the building from outside. So again, this is what we mean by the hyper-ceremonialism that seems to characterize these centers. It also extends to the various kinds of ornamental items or the ceremonial regalia which are found at places like Chaco and Nazca. There's many images that I could show you, uh, and I've given a lecture before on Chaco wealth, which goes through a lot of that. Uh, this, I think, is a great depiction of that. This is a squirrel uh, pelt cape that has macaw feathers uh, sewn into the surface of it. Uh, found during the Chaco era, not found in Chaco proper, but found during the era. Below you can see the spondylus shell necklaces, the gold um, uh, emblems here, which are probably earrings that were found uh, associated with Chaco, I'm sorry, with Nazca. And one thing which is important to note about these is that all of them seem to be tied to either creatures um, or they represent iconographically um, symbols of things like water, especially water, creatures that live in water and near water like these moths and, and butterflies. Uh, the shell, of course, being a, a symbol of water and even the macaws and the use of the blue here being a symbol of water. And this is an iconographic canon that seems to permeate both of these societies. Another example of the, what we call the hyper-ceremonialism is these new interpretations about what these roadways and geoglyphs may have been used for. It's, there's been, of course, many theories posed about uh, the, the function of the Nazca lines, uh, but one which seems to be gaining uh, quite a bit of, uh, of, of credibility is the idea that these were used as ceremonial processionals. People would walk along these symbols of water, or walk along the lines, many of which are articulating with the, or symbolically with the Andes, where the water is coming from, and as part of this, there would be their ritual uh, obligations towards the ceremonial center. And looking at the sheer volume of these, you can't help but imagine there must have been many, many people during 
uh, certain pilgrimage events that would have been walking upon these lines in the hot desert sun. Chaco, too, uh, there's been work, I've done some of this work, and others certainly have posited this as well, that these roadways that are associated with Chaco Canyon aren't roadways in the way that we think of them, but are more like ceremonial causeways that may have been used for processionals, for ritual road races. You can imagine different kinds of scenarios about how they may have been used. So that's this one reason why we think that these are pilgrimage centers. Another is the massive amount of labor investment. Here's a reconstruction of Kawachi, and it gives you a sense of the scale of what this would have looked like during its height. And importantly, it's thought that there may have been a very small residential population living here. Clear, and then some people actually say that there was no residential population at all, and this was built entirely by people coming in from outside of the Nazca River Valley proper. This suggests a tremendous amount of investment of labor by people who aren't living there, who aren't necessarily benefiting in the day-to-day -day basis from the uh, monumentality of this architecture. Looking at Chaco Canyon, this is an interesting uh, graph. I don't show you a lot of these kinds of graphs, but here's one which I think is particularly interesting. Um, on the right-hand axis are the number of person hours in thousands that were invested at different time periods shown on the, on the bottom axis. Um, in the Great House architecture of Chaco Canyon. It doesn't include the investment in building roadways or designing uh, um, celestial observatories or any of that. It's just for the buildings. This is work that was done by Steve Lexon some years ago. On the left-hand axis and represented by the, the uh, dotted line are the number of great houses that uh, exist outside of Chaco Canyon in these distant farming villages. Uh, all those red dots that I showed you earlier. And it seems to me to be more than just a coincidence that the rapid, uh, not even as beyond exponential growth in the amount of labor invested in the monumentality of Chaco Canyon uh, coordinates quite well, uh, or, uh, correlates quite well with the number of great houses that are being built outside of the canyon. And so the suggestion here is that these are where people are coming from, bringing in their labor to help to construct the excessive, over-engineered monumentality that makes up Chaco Canyon. The third bit of evidence to suggest that Chaco and Nazca were pilgrimage destinations is that they were major consumers of the best that the world had to offer them at that time and place. Chaco Canyon, for example, is the location where all kinds of exotic materials went in. Everything from trees to roof all of those buildings, volcanic glass, uh, obsidian coming from the east, turquoise, of course. There's a huge amount of turquoise found there. Cacao that may actually have come all the way from Mesoamerica, which has been recently uh, discovered in Chaco Canyon. Shell coming from the Gulf of California and perhaps the Gulf of Mexico. Some of the best pottery that Chaco could get is coming into the canyon, huge amounts of pottery. And even other odd things like these chamahillas made out of very uh, interesting stone that has uh, exotic colors in them, which are also coming into Chaco Canyon. And what's most interesting about it is this stuff comes in, but it doesn't ever go back out. As far as we can tell, things come in, people leave the stuff there, but they aren't taking anything back out that at least is material and economic in a way that as archaeologists we can identify it. Nazca is not quite as well known. There's still a, work that, a lot of work that hasn't been published on, on Kawachi. But minimally, we know that things like gold are going into Kawachi. Amazing textiles. The textile record for the Nazca area is incredible, made out of camelid um, uh, text, uh, uh, fabric fibers. This is a, I love this, this vessel of a killer whale. Uh, a lot of the pottery is being made outside of Kawachi and being brought in. And then, of course, the shell, which I mentioned before, coming from the coast. So both of these places are net consumers of all the best that exists in their world. And this suggests the final point, which I want to make to show that these are indeed pilgrimage destinations, is that for all this stuff to come in, for all the labor to come in and all these goods, it means that people are coming from long distances away in order to contribute to this. Just looking at where these dots are located, where these great house communities exist outside of Chaco Canyon, I think it's no coincidence these are the directions where all these uh, exotic items are coming from. In the case of Nazca, we have somewhat unfortunate evidence to show the volume of people coming in as visitors. 
This is one of the famous Nazca cemeteries, and this is an aerial view. I just pulled this off of Google Earth just a couple days ago. You can go to Google Earth and see the, this travesty. Um, all of those dimples are pot hunter holes, and they're pot hunter holes because Nazca, I'm sorry, the, the Kawachi, the region around Kawachi, was covered with cemeteries. And it's pretty clear that people are bringing their deceased to Kawachi, probably for some ceremonial activities, and then burying their dead in the landscape surrounding Kawachi proper. And of course, because they were burying them with the textiles and the pottery and all the stuff that I just showed you, they are prime targets for, uh, for the uh, looters, the hawkeros who dig these up. And um, for archaeologists, it makes it easy to find the, the thousands of burials that uh, at least are known from these looter holes. So what we're concluding is that Chaco and Nazca, for, in our estimation, is clear demonstration of pilgrimage in which these monumental centers are being built, funded, contributed to by pilgrims that are coming in from long distances away, leaving the, their very best labor effort, their very best of the resources they had available to them in their distant villages, not unlike what we see today in many pilgrimage sites like this one in Vietnam, where people are actually jostling with one another in order to give their donations of money and other goods to this particular pilgrimage site. So if this is true, then of course Chaco and Nazca are great places to look to explain why pilgrimage at this kind of scale emerges in the first place. So I'm going to f explore the next set of similarities, four similarities into, that explain when, where, and how Chaco and Kawachi developed. And hopefully these similarities will help us understand uh, exactly why pilgrimage centers anywhere develop. Now the first is this, that they have very similar climactic histories. Even though they're separated in different spaces, different time periods, uh, the climactic histories are actually quite similar. And we only knew about this in the last couple years. Whereas in the southwest, of course, we have great uh, dendroclimatological records that are built from the same tree ring sp uh, specimens that are used for building uh, the uh, tree ring dating sequences. Uh, we know exactly when droughts occur. You can even use, depending on the species, uh, these rings in order to tell whether it was colder or warmer. We don't have anything quite this precise for Nazca. But in the last few years, there has been some interesting work done in caves just above the coastal desert, looking at stalagmites and stalactites because they form in ways that are analogous to the formation of tree rings. As the rains come to the foothills of the Andes, that water then percolates down into these caverns and drips to these slagmites and stalactites, and the calcite that's left behind has an isotopic record of exactly what the climate was like when that rainfall took place. And so this, you can see, this almost looks like a tree ring sample, but you can imagine being built up as, as this, uh, these deposits, these calcite deposits form. Now, it's not nearly as precise as what we have in the southwest, uh, and there's years that are skipped and so forth, so we don't have as great a, con a control, but we do have enough of a control to suggest that there are some amazing similarities between the sequences. I'm going to show you uh, exactly what the sequence looks like, uh, but before I do that, I want to... Uh, tell you what's important to look at here. Now obviously we live here in the southwest, we know that rainfall of course is one of the most important things and we're undergoing a drought and, and everybody's concerned about whether it's going to rain or not and so that's certainly a major factor. But it's important to recognize that one's sense of the amount of appropriate rainfall depends upon what you've experienced in the past. So for example, when I go to Florida and they're complaining about their water crisis, it's really hard for me to get my mind around because I grew up here and I spent all these years here. And for me, it just seems to rain constantly and it's quite green. So again, it really matters in what you have in your, in your collective experience to gauge whether things are wetter or drier and so forth. Similarly, what's particularly important is the unpredictability of the climate. If it's predictable, and if it's always dry, at least you know it's always dry and you can adapt to those circumstances as we know people around the world have done. But if it's unpredictable and every year is very different, then it's really difficult for you to figure out how to deal with that kind of climate. And more often than not, you turn to ways to try to influence that climate, whether it's trying to use science or whether it's entreaties to the gods or supernatural forces. 
uncertainty certainly causes people to try to find solutions to it. So before these centers emerge, things are relatively wet for these respective desert environments. Um, and they're quite unpredictable. From year to year, you just don't know exactly what's going to happen. And this, of course, causes quite a bit of stress. As these centers begin to emerge then, you can see that it gets drier, uh, but it becomes less unpredictable, so it's a little easier to deal with. But this juxtaposition here, we think, is exactly the point at which these pilgrimage centers begin to emerge, as you can see here, the early stages of the pilgrimage centers. It's when things are getting drier, but the unpredictability is still problematic. In these circumstances, you might imagine that people, these farmers, are trying to find ways to influence their environment. During the center's height, there's still unpredictability. It's part of living in a desert environment, but it's less unpredictable, which I realize is a double negative, but I wanted to make sure you, I wasn't suggesting it was entirely predictable. Um, and it's getting wetter during the heights of both of these centers. As you might imagine and predict, the collapse is tied with both rapid drying, especially in the Nazca sequence, um, and increasing unpredictability. So it's like the worst of both worlds. Not only is it much drier than you remember from the past, but it's also much more unpredictable what's going to happen from year to year. And in this context, you might imagine then that we would find, and we have found evidence, that this is where you see competitive religious context emerging. For both of these places, we think, uh, most archaeologists think, that there's, a, there's not much of centralized, powerful authority, but there is a theocratic authority that is represented in the case of Chaco, for example, by burials that have been recovered from some of the rooms in Pueblo Benito and other places. There's, in the case of Pueblo Benito, for example, evidence that this theocratic authority wasn't um, unchallenged. So we know, for example, that there's more than one burials, uh, set of burial rooms in, in uh, Pueblo Benito. And we also know that one of those individuals that's found in the northern burial room, which is illustrated here, was actually dispatched by a blow to the back of the head. So it's pretty clear that these are competitive religious contexts. And we find the same in the case of, of Kawachi. Some burials, like one which was discovered recently, which is being called the Priestess of Kawachi, which had this amazing, actually it's not this one, but it's like this one, an amazing gold mask that was found in her, in her, uh, in her burial. Other evidence of the competitive nature of the religious uh, environment is that these centers don't exist alone. It's, much, it's quite clear in the case of Kawachi that there is actually a competitor earlier on up in the Ica Valley, which you can see up there to the north, and that's where my colleague Kevin Vaughn is now going to try to test some of these ideas which I'm presenting tonight to see exactly the nature of this competition between Kawachi and Ica. Some recent discussions, we don't have a lot of evidence of this yet, but there's been some recent discussions that at least the earliest great houses uh, in Chaco Canyon, they too may have not been necessarily cooperative with one another, they may have been competitors with one another. And insofar as these are ritual structures, again, this might be evidence of a competitive religious uh, uh, landscape. The third bit of evidence which we think is useful for understanding the development of these pilgrimage centers is that in both situations, not only do we have a complex religious environment, we also have a complex social context. And part of the reason for this is because populations are just exploding during this time period. This shows you a sequence of population um, estimates that are made for the Longhouse Valley, which is actually over in what is now Arizona, but is a good illustration of what we expect to see um, throughout the Pueblo and Southwest during the time periods represented here. During the growth of Chaco, this is the growth of populations. And you have to imagine that although this is taking place over a couple hundred years, it is the kind of situation that ethnographically we know is quite stressful. It's stressful because traditional systems of sharing, of reciprocity, are challenged by the fact that there are more and more people that you just don't know that are living nearby you. And to illustrate this even better, I'm going to zoom into an area where I've been working over the past quite many years. Uh, this area here, if I flatten it out and show you this computer reconstruction, 
This is uh, the study that I've been working in. Um, down the center of it, in this uh, uh, digital topography, you can see what is the Dutton Plateau. Those dark areas are cliffs. Those are the Red Mesa cliffs that you see in the Red Mesa Valley between Grants and Gallup, where Interstate 40 goes right through that sort of flat area there to give you some context. Crown Point is right up near where it says AD 700, so those of you who have been to the rug auction will know this area. The sequence I'm going to show you is going to take all the information about sites that we know from here, and it's going to show you how they appear and disappear. So what you'll notice, these green sites, these green dots, are where normal people live. Those are just households. As the years go on, it's, there's not a lot of growth of population, but when you get to the late 800s, starting about now, bam, all of a sudden there's more and more households in this area, and those red dots come in. Those are great houses and great kivas that are showing an affiliation of this area with Chaco Canyon. And then it's, you can you imagine the number of people living there now if you drive down Interstate 40 between Grants and Gallup? It's an, a tremendous number of people in a relatively short period of time. And we can only imagine that this was stressful in the ways that I described earlier. And there's some evidence to suggest this. If I look back in that same study area which I just showed you, We've done work to look at pottery exchange, to look at the exchange of volcanic glass or obsidian that suggests that indeed as these populations grow, the sharing networks through which commodities uh, flowed begin to get truncated. Things don't flow as far as they used to flow and that's because there's more strangers that are surrounding you and you're just not sure that you can really begin to move your commodities in the form of corn and other kinds of surpluses through those spaces. And yet, interestingly, you might expect this would be a time period when you see a lot of violence, but in fact, you sort of see the opposite. It's what Steve Laxon has sometimes referred to as the Pox Chaco when it comes to, uh, to uh, the Chaco in sequence. And we, although there's still some evidence of violence and it does amp up a little bit later in Chaco Canyon sequence, in general, it's a time period which is much more peaceful than periods before or periods after. Evidence of this is not just looking at the numbers of people killed through violent action, but even where people are living. These are not defensive communities. The place that I've been working for a number of years is built at the base of a cliff. That's where all these households are. That is not a defensible location. Later in time, people become much more concerned about that as they had earlier in time, but not during the height of Chaco. In the case of Nazca, the same thing. People are living in very exposed locations. Another bit of evidence of this pro-social environment is that the trade networks, although commodities that, th that typically flow through sharing networks aren't as uh, vibrant as they once were, people are still getting access to exotic items like shell and turquoise in levels that they hadn't before. So we have something of a paradox here in which we have evidence of things getting more complicated and yet we have positive things like the lack of violence and the fact that people are able to get things that they, that they covet. So to wrap this all up, how do we explain this? The last section of this lecture, I want to go into a, a little bit more detail about a theoretical perspective that we've been advocating. Uh, there's going to be some slides with text, which I'll make sure I'll give you time to, to look at, but there's only one way I can explain this, and that is for you to, to see my argument. So how do we pull this all together to propose a model for explaining emergence and development of pilgrimage centers? So I'm going to show you two image, two um, statements here, and this is the crux of our, of our argument. And the first is that the pilgrimage center, places like Chaco and Kawachi, are costly signals of status for religious leaders. The second statement is that the act of pilgrimage itself is a costly signal of religious adherence by the pilgrims that are engaged in this. Now, either these can exist alone and have throughout history, but when they exist at the same time, we think this leads to an explosion of these kinds of monumental centers. So some of you may not be familiar with the term costly signal, so I'm going to go into some detail about what that actually means. So what is a costly signal? So the history of costly signaling theory, as it's, as it's termed, uh, actually goes back to 1899 with the publication of Thorstein Veblen's The Theory of the Leisure Class. And he was looking at the 
rampant, conspicuous consumption that he saw taking place during this era of industrialization. And what he argued was that conspicuous consumption was really the only way that the wealthy could symbol or signal their wealth. Because wealth tends to be hidden. It's something that's not seen. I could tell you I'm a wealthy person, but you won't know that unless you see me driving away from this lecture in a Bentley, which you won't, be, you won't see that happen. Uh, I'll, I'll be taking tips later so I can get my back. So again, so this is, an, this is an idea that goes back to 1899, but it's one that has most often been attributed to the biologist Amats Zahavi, who developed what he called the handicap principle in 1975, but which today we largely subsume, along with Veblen's work, under this, this uh, rubric of costly signaling theory. Now, Zahavi's work is very interesting because it's been used to explain a lot of the natural world, things that happen in the natural world. It is not the mainstream, biologically accepted uh, theory, but it is one which is gaining, I think, some, um, some uh, in interest. I'm showing you this gazelle here to try to explain how Zahavi's theory works. Gazelles start, and that's what this gazelle is doing here. And starting is when a gazelle jumps into the air, jumps into the air when it seems like there's some danger nearby. Now, for most of us, when we think there's a danger nearby, the last thing we want to do is to waste energy just jumping into the air. You would, wait, you would want to just take off. If you know there's a cheetah nearby, you just want to take off. But in this case, what Zahavi has argued for this and many other examples in the natural world, the gazelle is starting because it is a signal of its strength and its stamina. The cheetah, which is observing all these gazelles out there, it's looking and said, which one am I going to chase? It's like, oh, that's some pretty studly starting. I'm not going to chase that one. <laughs> because if it, that gazelle can start like that, then it probably can run faster than I can. And so it looks around and finds a gazelle, which is it's starting as, uh, uh, like when I play basketball, is not, not very impressive whatsoever. And so it chases that one. This is, in the language that's used here, a way of, of coordinating the decision making between these two animals. This has been used, this kind of, of argument of costly signaling has been used to explain mutually beneficial coordination that you see throughout the natural world. Peacocks, tails, all kinds of things that are seen. We, we were at Jackalope and saw the uh, prairie dogs. The prairie dogs squeak when it senses danger is also now thought to be a costly signal because that particular prairie dog is, a, is vulnerable if it squeaks. But the fact that it squeaks shows that it is actually representing a hidden quality, its strength to actually be able to evade this predator that might be out there in the, in the world. So the question then becomes, OK, well, that all is very interesting, but what's that have to do with pilgrimage? Uh, again, we're arguing that it has a lot to do with pilgrimage, at least in some circumstances. The question is, what could pilgrimage be a, a costly signal of? So I'm going to show you three statements here. These are the three conditions we think are necessary for this to work. First of all, the strength of adherence to a religious system and its moral codes varies and is not observable. This is just like the, the wealth and Veblen's theory. It's just like the stamina and strength of a particular gazelle in Zahavi's theory. One's belief, you, you don't know what I believe in just by looking at me. And my, the strength of my belief in any particular uh, religious system, of course, is unknown to you. Okay, so that's one of the first conditions. The second then, and this is very important for this to work, is that devotees benefit from broadcasting their adherence to a belief system. And this is because it builds reputation. And for those of you who know uh, or follow or are interested in things like game theory, decision theory, and so forth, reputation is critical for interpersonal interaction, particularly with strangers. Because you have no idea if you're going to someone and you want to trade with them, you don't know what to expect. If they're a person who's worthy of this exchange that you want to uh, engage in. So, if I know something about their belief system, I have information 
that helps to guide my decision as to whether to engage them in whatever transaction, social or material or economic, that I want to engage in them with. So this is a very important part of this. If I know something about the belief system, then that's a good thing. The problem is that people can fake it. They can fake what I believe in. And we see this quite a bit. In the, in the language of decision theory, these are what are called cheaters. Um, and these are people who can benefit from pretending that they believe in something, that they have particular reputation. So as someone who wants to engage with someone I know nothing about, it would be very useful for me not to just to ask them, hey, so what's your belief? You know, what do you believe in? But to actually see it demonstrated in a way that cannot be faked. That it's an honest signal or a costly signal that actually truly represents what that individual believes in and then helps guide me in making decisions. So if that's the case, if all these three conditions hold, then we might expect behaviors or signals where the cost correlates honestly with the strength of the signaler's adherence to the religious system. And what we're arguing is that's exactly what you see in these centers. Spending all that time walking hundreds of kilometers on the geoglyphs or the causeways in Chaco in the hot sun, spending all of your energy that you have to build these amazing buildings to contribute all of the goods that you find being consumed by these centers, these are all costs which arguably, we say, are good signals. These are costly signals of your belief, of their belief, in this particular religious system, either in the Kawachi one or the Chaka one. Now, what about the pilgrimage center itself? I said there were sort of two statements. One is that these centers relied upon pilgrims using it as a costly signal. And the, se the second was that uh, the religious centers themselves were costly signals of authority. Well, the costliness of these monuments, and there's a long history of theory on this particular part of it, the costliness of the monuments and the spectacle that exists here signal the status, the wealth, the authority, the supernatural power that is held by the center's leaders. And so if this all holds, then you can imagine scenarios in which pilgrims need ways to signal their adherence. The theocratic leaders are very happy to accept ways to build their centers. And these can explode. And that's what we're arguing is that when you see these centers, there's a particular moment in which they just explode, like you saw in those labor reconstructions for just the great houses in Chaco Canyon. The greater the spectacle, the stronger the signal it is of the leader, uh, leader's strength. And the greater the spectacle, the stronger the signal it is of the pilgrim's devotion. And so accordingly, we come up with some expectations of the model, which remarkably fit the patterns that we actually uh, have observed, which I've described to you before. First is that pilgrimage is expected when there's more strangers, when the social environment is much more complex, and you need ways to demonstrate who you are and what you believe in, and, and that you're a trustworthy participant in these exchanges. The second is that centers would be expected when the environmental uncertainty which I described quite a bit of, opens the way for competing religious forms. And then finally, the growth of these centers then should correlate with time periods when there's widespread evidence of pro-social behavior. Because if this all works and everybody's signaling appropriately, then people are actually getting along OK. Because they know one another, even if they have never encountered one another before, because they have these reputations that are built on their engagement with the ceremonial centers. Now, of course, those of you who are skeptics out there, which I hope all of you are, will look at this and say, this is sort of interestingly similar to what you've described. And that's because the way that we've developed this was by looking at these patterns and saying, huh, this seems to fit pretty well. So what we're doing now is going out and trying to gather additional data uh, to try to test this further to see if it works. And this includes looking at centers beyond just Chaco and Kawachi, looking at places like Hopewell, or any of the other centers that, it, that you might imagine exist out there. The end of Chaco, then, to wrap up the lecture, is sort of interesting because it ends from the inside out. 
These dots show you the dates at which a particular great house, either inside or outside the canyon, ceases to be used. And what you'll note is that the smaller the dots, the um, earlier in time it stops being used. And that happens first around Chaco Canyon. Now, the dates here are sort of fuzzy, so you sort of have to squint at it, which you probably have to do anyway, so it's not terribly a focus. But you can get an idea about where the smallest dots are, and they're closest to Chaco Canyon. And that's where it falls apart first. That pilgrimage center, just like Kawachi, just collapses. And the reasons for this are because if any piece of that model, which we described, fails, then the center completely fails. Because if pilgrims no longer, if they're doing this cost-benefit analysis, and no longer is the cost of engaging in the pilgrimage providing them any benefits, then they'll stop going. They'll stop engaging in it. And the center then will begin to fall apart. And of course, interestingly, this collapse begins at the time when there's a drought. So not only is, it, is the drought making it more difficult to get things anyways, the costs are going up for the pilgrims, the benefits are going down, and the efficacy of the religious system is probably also under stress because no longer are the conditions good. So it collapses, it collapses hard. The same thing happens in the case of Kawachi. And again, we're continuing to test these ideas, so I appreciate any and all comments. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you, Linda.